Good morning, everyone. I have switched off my mobile phone. I once failed to do that when I was giving a lecture, and I was staring at the audience really angrily and realised it was my own bag that was making the noise, so learned that one. Well, my lecture today explores archaeological approaches to the study of later medieval monasticism in Scotland. I want to reflect on the construction of archaeological knowledge and how that's shaped by national identity and the contemporary social value that we place on medieval heritage. My focus is on the 12th century, when Scotland embraced reformed orders of monks and canons, such as the Cistercians and the Augustinians. These orders revived the communal model of Benedictine monasticism and placed greater emphasis on poverty and manual labour in monastic life. My aim in discussing this, in choosing this topic, is to place the Scottish experience in comparative perspective, to identify what is distinctive and significant about medieval monasticism in Scotland. And I hope that this will be a fitting contribution for Scottish Year of History, Heritage and Archaeology. The archaeology of later medieval monasticism in Scotland remains a relatively underdeveloped field. And I'd like to reflect on why this may be the case and to suggest that an explicitly archaeological research agenda is long overdue. I'm an outsider to this subject in many ways, but with a knowledge of monastic archaeology, and I hope that I can bring some fresh perspective to bear on the study of Scotland's monastic archaeology. The subject has evolved along a similar path to that travelled elsewhere in Europe. Archaeological interest focused initially on the monastic core of the church and cloister, with more recent work expanding to include monastic landscapes, industry and buildings of the outer court. Excavations have taken place on numerous sites, many of which I'll, I'll discuss today, although mostly on a small scale, and important synthetic works on monastic archaeology and architecture were published over 20 years ago by Peter Yeoman and Richard Fawcett. Yet despite important investigations on individual sites and landscapes, monastic archaeology in Scotland lacks a critical framework of analysis to draw out its distinctive character. Archaeological approaches have remained principally descriptive and dominated by historical and archaeological architectural excuse me, questions. There's been relatively little interdisciplinary or theoretical engagement to address social questions about later medieval Scottish monasticism or its material character. This is in contrast with recent uh, interdisciplinary frameworks that have been developed for the study of later medieval monasteries in Wales and Ireland. The Monastic Wales and Monastic Ireland projects feature web-based gazetteers that bring together historical and archaeological evidence and share it with a public audience. The academic volume resulting from the Welsh project frames an important historical question that has immediate relevance to contemporary debates around Welsh national identity. It explores the significance of monasteries in medieval Wales, that is, how religious men and women shaped Welsh history and culture. Historical, archaeological and literary evidence is examined to begin to draw out the distinctive pattern of Welsh monasticism and to make Welsh monasteries more visible, both in terms of scholarship and accessibility to a wider public. As far as I'm aware, there's no sister project in Scotland to those on the Welsh and Irish monasteries. So why has the study of later medieval monasteries in Scotland failed to achieve a higher profile? Richard Fawcett argued that Scottish monasteries are under-recognised due to the poor survival of architectural remains, and because insufficient effort has been made to make information on them available. He also cites the historiographical tradition. There was little interest in medieval architecture among Scottish antiquaries in the 19th century, in contrast with other European traditions. Scotland's medieval monasteries were neglected by 19th century Presbyterian historians who were disinterested in Catholic heritage. They viewed the reformed monasteries as morally corrupt, alien impositions. Their interest focused instead on the early medieval Chaldees, which were regarded as primitive and pure and provided an historical precedent for Presbyterianism. So Scottish monastic history has been dominated until very recently by nationalist perspectives which focused on the struggle for independence from England. For example, our Broth Abbey is celebrated as a setting for the declaration of our Broth and Melrose Abbey as a resting place for the heart of Robert the Bruce. But why has Scottish archaeology failed to develop a critical framework for the analysis of later medieval monasteries? 
The key issue seems to be the role that Scottish national identity continues to play in selecting topics for archaeological study. <clears throat> Later medieval monasteries have been neglected because a lower value has been placed on them by heritage professionals, academic researchers, and members of the public. Value in this sense refers to the social significance placed on archaeological remains and their potential contribution to contemporary culture and political debates. There's <clears throat> little doubt that Scotland's later medieval monasteries have been overshadowed by those of its golden age, the so-called Celtic monasteries of the 6th to the 9th centuries. Island communities such as Iona, with its charismatic founder, St. Columba, have captured the imaginations of historians, archaeologists, and the wider public, including advocates of contemporary spirituality, termed the New Celtic Twilight. Archaeological study of Scotland's early monasteries is thriving, signalled by landmark publications on Port Mahomac, Inchmarnock, and the Isle of May. These excavations have revealed early monastic centres for manuscript production, teaching and learning, and healing and pilgrimage. A useful comparison can be made with Ireland, where archaeological interests have focused predominantly on Ireland's golden age, circa 500 to 900. Early medieval monasteries have been valued as the apogee of native Irish culture, in contrast with later medieval monasteries that carry the negative overtones of Norman colonisation. Throughout the 20th century, archaeological scholarship on medieval Ireland was dominated by the Golden Age narrative. But the current Monastic Ireland project that I mention focuses on the period 1100 to 1700, and it therefore represents a major step change in scholarship and may signal a corresponding shift in the social and cultural value that's being placed on Ireland's later medieval monastic heritage. The focus on Scotland's golden age is the legacy of a wider historical tradition that developed in the 19th century, stemming from the popularisation of Scottish history by Sir Walter Scott. It's a good place to talk about this in the National Museum. The resulting narratives of medieval Scotland emphasise ethnic differences between Celtic and Anglo-Norman culture. The historian Matthew Hammond has examined the pervasive influence of this dualistic ethnic framework on the development and periodization of Scottish history, which draws a sharp boundary around the year circa 1100, separating the Celtic Scotland of the 11th century from Norman Scotland of the 12th century. He argues that culture and cultural and political projections of ethnic value that began in 19th century scholarship continue to construct historical discourses, particularly around Scottish law, kingship, lordship, and religion. Within archaeology, the situation may be exacerbated by the small number of, of later medievalists operating in the field. Certainly, there are appointments to the Royal Commission and the National Museum, but they've been largely absent from university departments. And it's not surprising, therefore, that a higher value tends to be placed on early medieval monasteries. For example, in the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework, 2012. This is an excellent document, but it does repeat the common tendency to undervalue later medieval monasticism as a social and cultural phenomenon. SCARF identifies priorities for future research on religion exclusively in the early medieval period, including early medieval sculpture, churches, cemeteries, and the relationship of proto-historic settlement to prehistoric ritual landscapes and practices. <clears throat> the period up to the later 8th century is described as, quote, the most inventive religious phase in Scotland, when belief was regional and creative. We can perhaps infer from its absence that archaeologists consider later medieval monasticism to be the inverse of the Golden Age, manifested by pan-European monastic orders such as the Cistercians and lacking regional diversity, innovation, and creativity. The research framework emphasizes the importance of placing early medieval monasticism within a long-term perspective that connects it with prehistory in the tradition of the long Iron Age of Ireland and Scandinavia. This is informed by Martin Carver's intriguing thesis that the early medieval monastic practices were influenced by prehistoric rites. He notes precursors for early medieval monastic traits, including the use of curvilinear enclosures, stone slab kist burials, stone markers, and the curation of ancestral bones that has continued in the cult of relics. <clears throat> 
He concludes that early medieval people adapted archaic forms to reconcile changing beliefs and as a means of self-expression. Carver calls for early medieval monasticism to be placed within an interpretive framework that looks back at prehistory. In contrast, Stephen Driscoll argues for early medieval monasticism to be placed in a long-term perspective that looks forward towards the later Middle Ages and the modern, placing sites like early medieval Govan in a framework of historical archaeology spanning 1,500 years from the 6th to the 21st centuries. Driscoll argues that national identity has influenced the Scottish archaeological research agenda, and in particular the drive to demonstrate cultural distinctiveness from England. This helps to explain the low profile of Scotland's later medieval monasteries. They are accorded a relatively low cultural value because they do not figure in dominant discourses of Scottish heritage and national identity. Reform monasticism of the later Middle Ages is often regarded as an English import, perhaps not an instrument of direct colonisation as it was in Wales and Ireland, but certainly not an expression of native culture. So the first step in developing a more critical framework for the study of Scottish medieval monasteries is therefore to consider the construction of archaeological value. <clears throat> So how do later medieval monasteries look through the lens of archaeological value that's articulated in the Scottish archaeological research framework? To what extent are they inventive, regional, and creative? Later medieval monasteries are typically characterized as innovators in economy and technology, something that I discussed last night. In Scotland, monasteries introduced coal mining, intensified salt panning, and operated granges dedicated to ironworking, lead, silver, and gold mining. They developed new approaches to sheep and cattle farming based on monas the monastic system of granges. They stimulated local pottery production in the 12th and 13th centuries in areas that were previously aceramic, as excavations at Kelso and Dundrennan abbeys have suggested. And of course, that hallmark of monasticism, they introduced high quality plumbing and water management, vividly illustrated by the superior engineering of the late 14th century Great Drain of Paisley that was rediscovered in 1990. That's how we normally value them. But the cultural contribution of Scotland's monasteries should not be overlooked, such as the essential role played by the friars in education and in the establishment of medieval universities at St Andrews, Aberdeen and Glasgow. In the 14th century, campaigns of rebuilding at Melrose, St. Andrews, and Paisley stimulated a distinctive Scottish architectural style that blended influences from France and the Low Country to produce architecture quite distinctive from that of contemporary England. This list could go on, but is perhaps becoming too reminiscent of the Monty Python sketch from the life of Brian. For this, you could substitute what did later medieval monasteries do for Scotland? Well, there's the sanitation, medica medicine, education, wine, etc. The lectures immediately following this one will explore the inventive contribution made by medieval monasteries to healing and care of the body and the creative diversity of religious and magic beliefs that were encompassed by monasticism. But there's one important contribution that I would like to stress here. Reformed monasticism was truly transformational in providing new opportunities for women in Scotland to actively engage in religious practice. The fluorescence of Scotland's Celtic monasteries seems to have been reserved principally, if not wholly, for men. In contrast with early medieval monastic traditions documented for Ireland, England, and Francia, there is little documentary evidence for women's engagement with early monasticism in Scotland. The obvious documented exception is the Northumbrian monastery at Coldingham, which followed the Anglian model of the double house. Bede confirms that it was in existence by the 660s, presided over by Abbas Eber. The monasticism of the reformed orders channeled the agency of women as founders, patrons, nuns, and hospital lay sisters. The turning point may have been Queen Margaret, both for women and monasticism. She was the second wife of King Malcolm III and daughter of Edward the Aidling, who was son of the Anglo-Saxon King of Essex, Edmund Wessex, um, Edmund Ironside. Margaret was married at Dunfermline, circa 1070, to Malcolm Canmore, and she's credited with introducing reformed monasticism to Scotland, 
assisted by Archbishop Lanfranc of Canterbury, who sent three monks from Canterbury Christchurch to establish a Benedictine cell at Dunfermline. She's often regarded as the catalyst for the comprehensive transformation of Scotland under her sons and grandsons, in which monasticism was a key tool in nation building, particularly under Alexander I and David I. This so-called Canmore dynasty has been viewed as the breakpoint between Celtic and Norman Scotland and the beginning of Scotland's process of Europeanization. Matthew Hammond has recently called for a critique of the Canmore concept and its impact on the periodization of Scottish history. But the importance of Margaret as a religious innovator and role model for women remains convincing. Margaret was buried in front of the high altar at Dunfermline, dying just three days after her husband was killed at Annick in 1093. And for at least 100 years prior to her canonization in circa 1250, she was venerated by the gentry as a blessed intercessor and holy queen, obviously modeled on the Virgin Mary. Robert Bartlett has described Margaret's cult as regional and with a strong masculine core based on her miracle stories. However, she was called upon to assist women in pregnancy and childbirth. Several Scottish queens gave birth at Dunfermline in order to wear the relic of Margaret's birthing sock, or chemise. I'm going to resist a return to Monty Python at that point, actually, but I could have. Margaret's example was followed by women who established monasteries as pious acts of commemoration. Examples include Queen Ermengarde, wife of William the Lion, who established the small Cistercian Abbey at Balmerino, circa 1270, and was buried there. And my favorite, the romantic Lady Dervagilla of Galloway, who founded Cistercian Sweetheart Abbey in 1273 in memory of her husband, John Balliol. The abbey was named in reference to his embalmed heart, which resided in an ivory casket bound with enameled silver. Dovergilla was buried with this casket in the sanctuary of the monastic church at Sweetheart, and um, she's depicted on her, on her effigy holding the heart. Scotland had 15 nunneries, which have been largely dismissed by historians as, as relatively poor and small. There's very little scholarship on them, as far as I'm aware. But this reveals a misunderstanding of the role and scale of institutions for medieval religious women right across Europe. They were typically established to have a close relationship with the founding family. For example, the Augustinian nunnery at Iona was founded by Ragnar McSummerley in 1203, close to his foundation of the Benedictine monastery at Iona, and his sister, Bethok, became the first prioress. The well-preserved buildings of Iona nunnery compare favourably with surviving nunnery architecture elsewhere in England, Ireland, and Northern Europe in terms of quality and scale of architecture. They need to be considered within the context of nunneries rather than in comparison with major male monastic houses. The partially excavated site of the Cistercian nunnery of Elko outside Perth is thought to have been founded in the 13th century by David Lindsay of Glenesk and his mother, Lady Marjorie. The site has yielded imported, imported pottery comparable to that of the Burg of Perth and religious material culture, including paternoster beads and window glass. There were three copper alloy book clasps, a mount possibly from a book cover, and a nun's grave slab with an inscription, also the base of a hanging bronze oil lamp. Now, you may wonder why I've gone into such detail on what may appear to be a fragmentary assemblage of, of little note, but this is a unique group of finds representing literacy from a British nunnery. Nowhere else has come up with material culture to represent religious women's literacy in Britain. Even thoroughly excavated English nunneries, such as St. Mary Clerkenwell in London, have failed to produce material culture confirming literacy, in contrast with rich assemblages of literary material culture from male religious houses. I think this is important. The archaeological evidence for literate at Elko is a significant commentary on the spiritual life of Scotland's nunneries and the new opportunities that they provided for religious women. What was the role of monastic foundation in European nation building and how was the Scottish experience distinctive? This is a question that historians have, have been asking over the last few years. But first, just to set the context, what did Scottish monasticism look like in the late 11th century on the eve of monastic reform? 
Monasteries of the Golden Age had largely disappeared by the 9th century, although isolated communities of monks evidently survived. The biographer of, of Margaret, Turgot, described religious life in Scotland as, quote, very many men shut up in separate little cells in various places, who, though they were living in the flesh, practiced denial of the flesh through extreme asceticism. Now, his description may have been intended to minimize the importance of monastic life before Margaret, since he was celebrating her achievements. Nonetheless, it highlights an important emphasis on the Aramitic character of Celtic monasticism, a desert monasticism of the North Atlantic. It seems that 11th century Scotland had both individual hermits and island communities of ascetic monks. And it's likely that these communities continued to follow the Irish monastic lifestyle, living in individual cells, such as those on Canna, comprising the ruins of beehive cells in a stone enclosure. Early churches have been excavated on the Isle of May and Iona. Dating to the 10th century, these first stone structures were bonded in clay and built on a modest scale. But there were also communities of priests in 11th century Scotland who filled, fulfilled some type of pastoral role, the shadowy Caldees or Kelly Day. The term means companions or clients of God and was originally reserved for an elite class of Aramitic monks and hermits. By the 10th or 11th century, there were Aramitic Kelly Day at remote sites such as Inchifray and Loch Laven. We know this because they received uh, patronage from Margaret, so they're documented. But the term was also applied to communities of priests, such as those serving the Church of St. Andrews, which appears to have been a group of married clergy based on hereditary succession. So it seems that the spiritual needs of rural communities to the north of the Forth were served by secular priests of the Kelly Day, while the South followed the Northumbrian model of quasi-parochial minsters served by priests, for example at Whithorn. There was nothing in Scotland that resembled the reformed Western monasticism of French and England at this time. But the changes experienced by Scotland in the 12th century, which were quite profound, were part of a wider pattern across Europe in which local churches became more centrally controlled by Rome, and local rural rulers used monasticism as a tool to consolidate their own power. And I'll start with um, Normandy in, as an example, the heartland of reformed monasticism, where Norman dukes restored ancient monasteries that had been destroyed by their Viking grandfathers. So they destroyed them and then took complete credit for rebuilding them. The Dukes of Normandy appealed to local loyalties by rebuilding monastic <coughs> heritage, reviving the cults of Merovingian saints, and supporting the emergence of the reformed monastic orders that would dominate Europe throughout the Middle Ages. The Normans extended this strategy to England as part of the conquest. William used Norman monasticism as an instrument of colonization and consolidation in England, establishing new foundations and planting Norman monks in ancient monastic foundations such as Canterbury, Durham, and Glastonbury, to appropriate Anglo-Saxon sacred heritage. This process also involved major campaigns of rebuilding to establish the claustral plan at English monasteries, the cloister. There is no archaeological evidence for a monastic cloister in England before the Norman conquest. Uh, Glastonbury was, was commonly uh, cited for decades, but has recently been disproven by reanalysis of the archaeological archive. So the cloister was something which seems to come, in Britain at least, with reformed monasticism. And it's this Norman model of a Christian kingdom that was adopted by Scottish kings and Gallic nobles in the 12th and 13th centuries. Historians, including Keith Stringer and Amelia Jamrosiak, have suggested that reformed monasticism was not imposed on Scotland. Instead, the monastic cultural package was adopted as a part of state-making to create a unified European-style kingdom. Monasticism represented Europeanization. For Kings Alexander I and David I, founding monasteries was a way of consolidating the Kingdom of Scotland and bringing it into the mainstream of European culture. <clears throat> 
Their foundations sustained close connections to the royal house by serving as royal mausolea, particularly Margaret's foundation of Benedictine Dunfermline and David's foundations of Cistercian Melrose and Augustinian Holyrood. Monasticism in Scotland was rapidly transformed by the energy of the Canmore House, which spread its patronage widely. David founded four Cistercian monasteries, three Augustinian, two Turonensian, two Benedictine, and one Premonstratensian. I don't think there's anything to be compared anywhere else in Europe. He also established the first nunnery and introduced the Knights Templar and Hospitaller to Scotland. That's a lot to do in a, in a single lifetime. These monasteries had strong Anglo-Norman associations. They were often daughter houses of English monasteries and staffed by English monks. They have therefore been regarded as foreign introduction, along with other aspects of feudalism established in 12th century Scotland, such as burghs, sheriff courts, and coinage. But recent historical research cautions against a simplistic binary framework of Gallic equals old and Anglo-Norman equals new, and the associated projections of cultural value that these ethnic oppositions promote. For instance, the Gallic nobility and incoming Irish also founded monasteries and enrolled their sons and daughters as monks and nuns, while the local peasantry would have provided lay brothers for Cistercian and Premonstratensian abbeys and lay sisters for hospitals. Royal patronage was the catalyst for this rapid growth in Scottish monasticism in the 12th century. Uh, but Gallic nobles also, nobles also adapted the same cultural model of the Christian prince as monastic founder, perhaps in direct competition with the Canmores. A defining characteristic of 12th century monastic foundations in Scotland was the appropriation of indigenous sacred heritage. Reformed monasteries were created at ancient holy places, and new foundations actively promoted Pictish and Celtic saints, alongside the new emphasis placed on Christ, the Holy Trinity, and the Virgin Mary. Alexander I introduced the Augustinians to the ancient see of St. Andrews and established the Cathedral Priory as Scotland's chief ecclesiastical centre. He also created an Augustinian priory at Schoon, a locale resonating with religious and political significance as the ancient inauguration site of Scottish kings. Fergus of Galloway is credited with the, tra credited with the transformation of Whithorn, the shrine of St. Ninian's cult, to a cathedral priory staffed by the austere pre-monstratensian order. David I gave the Celtic shrine on the Isle of May to the Cluniacs of Reading Abbey, the foundation of his brother-in-law, the English king, Henry I. David also established new monastic foundations on or near the sites of Anglian minsters at Melrose and Jedburgh. And the reuse of these ancient sites sometimes required adaptation and engineering solutions to accommodate the claustral plan that was synonymous with reformed monasticism. At Jedburgh, excavations have shown that the choice to build on a steep river bank required the construction of a series of terraces cut into the river bank to provide a level platform for the claustral complex. And I think this sighting is significant. It was clearly determined by the desire for visibility and dominance of the landscape. The cliff face was consolidated to protect the buildings close to the river, and the jed water had to be diverted before the south range of the cloister could be built. So engineering solutions had to be found to affect a cloister in this prominent position and reusing the original site. Even the sacred site of Iona was subject to refoundation. The first Celtic monastery in Scotland, founded in AD 563, and the last to survive before reform. As well as housing the shrine of St. Columba, Iona was the burial place of Scottish kings up to the late 11th century, when it was eclipsed by Dunfermline. A Benedictine monastery was established at Iona circa 1200 by Ranald, son of Summerlee, a Gallic Norse warlord who had seized control of the Kingdom of the Isles in the mid-12th century. The enclosure of the early monastery at Iona is well preserved, confirming that Ranald chose to stamp his new Benedictine cloister onto the centre of the ancient complex. The Irish familia of Columba are reported to have burnt down the new Benedictine monastery, while a contemporary poem laments the arrival of foreigners and records the cursing of the Summerled line. <laughs> 
But it's important to note that Ranald's monastery actually aimed to promote rather than suppress the cult of St. Columba, or at least to appropriate. Spatial continuity of place was essential to harness the sanctity associated with St. Columba and his gravesite. Archaeological evidence suggests that the fabric of the existing shrine of St. Columba was incorporated in the new Benedictine complex, tucked between the west end of the church and, and the west range of the cloister. This tiny chapel was rebuilt in the 1960s, but the original walls survived up to one metre in height in the 19th century, and it was possible to identify the anti of the shrine chapel at the northwest and southwest corners. These are a feature of early Irish churches in which the side walls project forward. Excavations at Iona have confirmed that the shrine predates the Benedictine church. And excavations in the nave during the early 20th century revealed traces of earlier structures associated with burials containing quartz pebbles. This attempt to reuse parts of the existing church at Iona rather than build on a fresh site required compromises to be made in the Benedictine claustral plan. So the cloister was placed to the north of the church in contrast with the usual arrangement of a south cloister. So we've seen that state building in medieval Europe was often supported by a process of monastic foundation that revived or appropriated the sites of ancient monasteries. But what did the material manifestation of this cultural transformation mean for Scotland? How did the appropriation of sacred heritage involve the preservation, destruction, or modification of ancient sites? Considerable debate has focused on the question of the Chaldees and their possible continuity up to the end of the 13th century. They're key players in historical discourses that focus on the dualistic opposition between Celtic and Norman, stressing narratives of fierce Celtic resistance and pervasive Norman domination. Kenneth Vetch argued that the continuity of settlements resulted in important aspects of religious and social continuity while Geoffrey Barrow presented evidence for the institutional survival of the Chaldee at St. Andrews for 200 years after the foundation of the Augustinian Cathedral Priory. Excavations at Inchifray provide insight to the colonization of the former Chaldee by the Augustinian canons around about 1200. A major program of landscaping was undertaken on the site of an existing church and community. Soon after 1200, the site was terraced, as at Jedburgh, to prepare for the construction of the new church and cloister. And these were built over the remains of a, a wide earth bank, perhaps part of the enclosure of the early monastery. So there was an attempt to reuse the site, but the curvilinear enclosure was not regarded as important. This was swept away um, in favor of a claustral plan. And temporary structures were identified in the southern part of the site. An early kitchen and oven were found beneath the later West Range. A similar process of colonization is well documented by excavations at Jedburgh, established jointly by David I and Bishop John of Glasgow. <coughs> excavations have shown that completion of the full monastic complex may have taken 120 years. So that's four generations of the new community. It's possible that the Anglian Minster, the accommodation for the Minster, remained in place while these works were underway, possibly to the, to the north of the later um, cloistral complex. The church of the Augustinian Priory was constructed in stone, beginning in the customary manner at the eastern end, and the canons were accommodated in a series of temporary timber structures located beneath the side of the west range of the cloister. At both Inchifray and Jedburgh, temporary monastic structures were located in the area that would become the West Claustral Range, and which was generally the last monastic range to be constructed. So there's quite similarities in the way in which these, these two sites were converted. The other interesting site I'd like to refer to is the <coughs> Isle of May, where excavations have documented the process of converting the ancient Celtic shrine into a cell of Reading Abbey from around 1145. The monks colonized a site with a religious tradition which seems to have stretched back at least 500 years with an existing stone church that was perhaps 150 years old. And this church remained in use until a new one was built in the early 13th century. So this was clearly a living community, not one that had been abandoned. A cloister was constructed with the church as the North Range, 
I don't have a section of the site available, but what's very interesting is that four different levels were engineered to create a cloister on this severely constricted site. The church, East Range and Cloister were on the lowest level, with a step up to the Cloister Walk and West Range, another step up to the South Range, and a fourth up to the Latrine Block. So the effort required for construction at May demonstrates the importance of providing a formal cloister on the Benedictine model, even for this small cell of nine monks. The excavations at May also demonstrate continuity in the unusual burial practices of the island, which continued during and after monastic occupation. A burial ground to the north of the church contained layers of burials separated by beach stones in the manner of a cairn. This prompted one of the excavators, Peter Yeoman, to ask, why bury a Christian population under a burial cairn, a pagan form of burial, when there were other areas nearby where graves could be dug? At May, continuity with the early healing shrine was expressed by maintaining these ancient burial traditions, despite their divergence from orthodox traditions of reformed monasticism. So this is an important local choice about maintaining um, tradition and establishing identity. At Iona, medieval burials were found crammed in the sandy rock crevices of the shoreline to the south of the abbey, some within roughly formed long kists. These burials were principally of women, and two radiocarbon dates suggest that the practices extended from around 500 AD up to at least the early second millennium AD. The control of burial practices and rites would have been an important factor in the religious transition of the 12th century. <clears throat> the extensive excavations at Whithorn provide insight to the conversion of the Northumbrian minster to a premonstratensian cathedral priory from around 1177. The archaeology has been characterized by Peter Hill as urban from an early date, with evidence of manufacturing, well-defined street systems, coinage, and density of occupation. Although arguably all those things are also diagnostic of monastic occupation. Whithorn became a Northumbrian minster in the 8th century and was destroyed, destroyed by fire in the 9th century. Hill emphasizes shifts in the ethnic allegiances of Whithorn as the political and religious landscape changed over time, evolving from Irish to Hiberno-Norse to Anglican, Anglian, not Anglican, Anglian, <laughs> sorry, and demonstrating a Gallic horizon during the period of the monastic reform of the 12th century. He uses artifacts and building types as indicators of ethnicity, but we should be cautious in using archaeology as a simple material correlate for ethnicity. It's likely that material culture was exchanged and adapted between social groups and that religious and commercial communities at Whithorn were socially diverse throughout the 9th to 13th centuries. Archaeological evidence suggests continuity of religious settlement at Whithorn during the largely undocumented period of the 9th to the early 11th centuries, including the erection of a new timber church on a stone plinth this provides an institutional context for the sculptured crosses of the Whithorn School. Some of the timber buildings of this phase incorporated hearths, pits, and pavings, and those in the northern sector produced finds including spindle whorls, ornaments, and personal items. Now, spindle whorls are perhaps one of the few artifacts that can be regarded as gender-specific at this date, indicating that women may have resided at Whithorn Minster in the 10th or 11th century. This is entirely consistent with the model of married clergy staffing the church. The overall archaeological evidence confirms major expansion at Whithorn in the 11th to the 13th centuries when low-lying areas surrounding the minster were drained and new buildings were erected on reclaimed ground. Whithorn seems to have held on to its curvilinear plan with the early monastic precinct forming the central inner precinct and radial paths leading to an outer zone. Hill concluded that the most unexpected finding for this period is actually the absence of any clear evidence for the impact of the establishment of the reformed premonstratensian priory, including, concluding that Whithorn remained ostensibly a commercial settlement. But there are some significant indicators of change associated with the conversion of the monastery to a reformed cathedral. Um, in particular, the new church built in the mid-12th century seems to have been a simple cruciform with a short nave and a long eastern arm. 
Uh, it was con compared by uh, Raleigh Radford to uh, the churches of converted Chaldees at St. Andrews and also the Welsh site of Penman. It needed a disproportionately long eastern arm to accommodate the uh, stalls of the canon's choir. And the location of the church at Whithorn is believed to coincide with the site of St. Ninian's tomb and perhaps replaced an earlier building, much like the sequence at Iona. A further parallel between Whithorn and Iona is that both communities were provided with a cloister to the north of the church, an adaptation of the standard plan, a reversal of the standard monastic plan, perhaps necessitated by the reuse of the site of the earlier church, again demonstrating the importance of continuity of place. Whithorn's church was expanded considerably by the premonstratensians after 1200, with the nave and choir lengthened and crypts provided for the veneration of the relics of St. Ninian, and architectural fragments suggest that the, this rebuilding of the church and cloister was complete by the mid-13th century. So drawing all of this together, a critical comparative framework begins to draw out some distinctiveness of later medieval monasticism in Scotland exploring how the model of reformed monasticism was Scotticized in the 12th century. The transition of the Chaldees seems to have been achieved gradually, involving flexibility and variation in local response. The archaeological evidence at Whithorn mirrors the historical evidence at St. Andrews, which has been thoroughly discussed, indicating gradual change and assimilation rather than abrupt suppression. Excavations have shown that the conversion of sites, including Inchifray, Jedburgh, and May, all involved rapid campaigns to construct formal cloisters, requiring terracing and engineering solutions to accommodate the claustral plan on challenging sites. The cloister was evidently regarded as the cultural signature of reformed monasticism signaling Scotland's adoption of Kenobitic monasticism on the Benedictine model. The early attention given to founders um, but to building formal cloisters reflects the financial investment that accompanied monastic foundation and perhaps emphasizes a peaceful transition. The model of Kenobitic monasticism associated with claustral living seems to have been essential in the conversion of the Scottish Chaldees. This contrasts with the Welsh experience. In northwest Wales, Aramidic sites were selected for the foundation of Augustinian priories in the 13th century at the sites of former Welsh Chaldees. For example, excavations at Tudwell revealed a cluster of simple buildings associated with a small church in a stone enclosure. Karen Stober and David Austin have recently argued that the first phase of Augustinian foundations at the Welsh Chaldees use the native motif of building clusters within enclosures, very much in contrast with what we see in the conversion of the Scottish Coldies. But in Scotland, some traditional elements were retained, for example, the burial cairns at May. The most significant indicator of continuity was the choice of location for the church. At traditional cult sites like Whithorn and Iona, it was imperative to integrate the saint's grave and shrine within the rebuilding of the church, as it was at Irish monasteries such as Clonmacnoise and Inish Murray. Direct continuity of place was also critical in establishing new monasteries at former minsters, such as Jedburgh and Chaldees, including Inchifray and May. So the distinctiveness of Scottish monasticism can be found in the hybrid practices that connected reformed monasticism with Celtic sacred heritage. And I think the time is ripe for archaeologists to critically reassess the significance of the perceived watershed of 1100, just as historians are reflecting on the conventional framework of periodization and its impact on historical scholarship. In understanding why, where, and how Scotland emerged, we must explore the longer transition of Scottish religious experience from the 10th to the 13th century. Documentation of religious communities in Scotland is exceedingly rare in the 10th and 11th century, increasing the value of this archeological perspective. To what extent did the new monasticism incorporate elements of Celtic monasticism that had borrowed from the prehistoric tradition? I mentioned that Martin Carver suggested that the early Christian tradition in Scotland integrated prehistoric practices, such as the use of curvilinear enclosures, stone slab kist burials, stone markers, and the curation of ancestral bones. 
These elements continued in the reformed monasticism of the 12th century, with the exception of curvilinear enclosures, which were replaced emphatically by cloisters. It's also important to develop more critical perspectives around ethnicity. How were Gallic, Scandinavian, and Anglo-Norman traditions expressed and renegotiated through monastic material culture? Here we could learn from medieval archaeologists who've explored diaspora identities such as the Hansa, the German merchants who settled in Baltic Europe, or the Normans in Anglo-Saxon England. These approaches have emphasized the potential of ceramic material culture and food remains in exploring cultural signatures connected with ethnic identity. I would suggest that burial evidence would also be a key source of, uh, for exploring this theme in Scottish monastic archaeology. By placing Scottish monasticism in European perspective, we can contribute to an international research agenda for Scottish historical archaeology that evaluates Scotland, evaluates Scotland in its wider cultural context. A critical framework of archaeological analysis helps us to appreciate the value and significance of Scottish medieval monasticism. And I would argue and conclude that just like its Celtic precursor, later medieval monastic experience in Scotland was richly inventive, creative, and regional. Thank you.